Hi, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Okay, okay, great. The streaming is also has started just now. Yeah, you can see somebody sitting there. Good. Hello. Oh, Dr. Ghosh is also there. Good afternoon, Dr. Ghosh. Amit Ghosh. Did you see me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. I just saw you. I thought you waved to Amit. Uh, I thought you waved to Amit Roshan. No, no. Yeah. Yeah, I can see. Oh, yes. Yes. It takes a while to recognize people in the audience, but. I can't hear you clearly. No, your voice seems that you have some. Is it okay now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Now, Hey, 
দেখা যাবে না নাকি আমরা এই দিনেই থেকে scholars students and others who have joined physically as well as who are present in online mode we are really very happy that worst has selected our department that is department of botany university of calcutta to hold the jc shengupta endowment lecture which will be delivered by dr parumjit kurana from delhi university thanking you all for joining now may i request dr ramit ghosh to preside over the session and a few words to all of us thank you thank you very much uh, so west bengal academy of science and technology was formally founded in 1889 and every year it holds a couple of endowment lectures and today's lecture is in the memory of uh, a very distinguished botanist professor jyotish chandra shengupta professor shengupta was born in the year 1900 He obtained his doctorate degree from University of Heidelberg in Germany, and after he came back to India, he had many positions. Uh, he was a professor in Botany, Presidency College, then eventually became the principal of the college, and later on, when the Botanical Survey of India was uh, reorganized, he was uh, chosen to be the chief botanist. And uh, when he was there, he 
was instrumental in creating four first four uh, you know regional centers now i'm not a botanist so it will be a presumption on presumptuous on my part to say what he did but what i know from uh, you know from looking at uh, wikipedia and other places that uh, you know he was a uh, uh, his work spanned many fundamental and primary areas of botanical sciences and particularly his work on water absorption of common plants is highly regarded i am i am told that it's regarded all over the world and for his outstanding work he obtained many awards and rewards and one of the most prestigious ones was the paul rule medal which is given by the asiatic society is very 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 prestigious uh, work now he passed away in, in the year 1969 and uh, as has been mentioned by uh, dr kundu that uh, today's speaker is professor karanjit kurana another very distinguished plant scientist who is a professor in delhi university and i am personally honored to know her for many years now with this uh, i will request professor sampadas to give an introduction to today's speaker okay. थैंक यू प्रोफेसर खोस ये परमजीत खुराना डॉक्टर परमजीत खुराना टुडे स्पीकर हेलो डॉक्टर खुराना थैंक यू इज इट ऑडिबल यस यस सो टुडे इज वेरी ऑस्पिशियस ओकेशन as uh, dr ghosh already said that today um, we are from wast and in collaboration with calcutta university botany department we are conducting the jc bos in the moment uh, lecture event and uh, dr paranjit khurana will be speaking on this endowment uh, topic so she is from delhi university as already dr ghosh said she is very renowned a scientist from delhi university south campus her uh, specialization is plant molecular biology and plant genomics uh, dr khurana started her career in uh, from delhi university for more than 40 years yeah for more than 40 years she is associated with delhi university she graduated from uh, college under delhi university then post graduate and also did phd in delhi university and then for a little while she joined as scientist in the university uh, delhi university botany department not botany the plant cell and uh, molecular genetics unit or something else and in, in uh, 1983 1983 then she moved to khalsa college for 3 years she taught there and then again came back as research associate in uh, the south campus plant molecular biology department and um, then he moved to michigan state university for postdoctoral research after coming back she joined as lecturer in the same department and uh, till now she is continuing there as jc bush national professor she is very renowned scientist in the area of plant molecular biology and genomics her main um, interest interesting crops are wheat and mulberry wheat is the next cereal crop from rice the important cereal crop from rice and mulberry is the most industrially important crop Uh, so her um, plants are interesting plants are in these two and uh, she is more of stress biology and genomics she is addressing uh, some problems wheat you know wheat is very uh, temperature sensitive crop yeah. so her interest is to break this tem- temperature sensitivity of the particular crop and uh, she is working for about 25 30 years with that crop and also she is doing on mulberry mulberry is also very sensitive to salt and mulberry is very prone to insect attack so her aim is to 
raised different crop varieties of mulberry and wheat for stress resistance. These days, the world is suffering from just going to global warming. <coughs> global warming is a very um, burning issue of these days. So in this global warming um, time, if she can break this temperature sensitivity of wheat, that will be very uh, beneficial for wheat itself and for other uh, plant also. So she collected different varieties of wheat and then um, analyzed how different genes and transcription factors are responsible or are uh, induced during heat stress and uh, modifying or modulating those genes and transcription factors. Her aim is to raise, uh, to, to break the temperature sensitivity of the crop. So her mission is to, all, to develop all weather crops. I like the terminology, all weather crop. So I wish her um, best for fulfilling her aim. She is very renowned and I, I, uh, I don't know if I start for mentioning all the awards and uh, uh, honors she received from scientific community and different academics. Uh, it will take much time. She received so many awards, like she received Archana Sharma Memorial Award, and or, she also delivered Archana Sharma Memorial Lecture uh, by Nasi. And um, starting from her career, she received Bharat Ratna Rajiv Gandhi uh, Shakti Award, Shaman Shakti Award also and uh, Birbal Shahani Medal Award and uh, SK, SK Sinha Memorial Award and lots of awards she received. So I, I, I don't remember all. <laughs> the, the, the list is very long. And she is fellow of different scientific uh, academic uh, academies like Bangalore Academy of Science, uh, Allahabad Academy of Sciences, INSA, Indian National Science Academy, Indian uh, Agricultural uh, Science, Indian National Agricultural uh, Science Academy, and uh, also she is fellow of the World Health Ac World Academy of Sciences. So this is very prestigious uh, award, and as a women scientist, it is very. Um, honorable for her and we are really proud of her so she is member of different committees also she apart from her own research she is serving different uh, academies in, in the in policy making and in other activities she is always busy with that when i first contacted her um, at middle of december uh, and uh, the, this meeting has been scheduled on 4th of January, but she said during that time she is really busy, so it is not possible for her to present on 4th January. And then I saw that she is busy, she is really busy beyond 4th January, <laughs> the middle of January also, there are lots of meetings she was attending in the, the British Plant Tissue Culture Association meeting also she has to attend. And uh, she only came back on 26 January. So the earliest possible day is 30th January to get her uh, for delivering this lecture. So I am really thankful to her that amidst so much of BD schedule, she is she's serving, she has served DST, DBT in different uh, capacity, chairperson, co-chairperson of BioCare and so many other programs. She, is also, she also served um, PAC committee chairman, chairperson of the SCRB. So she is really busy, but uh, we are very uh, thankful to her that we got such a renowned and busy scientist to deliver uh, Jesse, Bose, uh, Jesse Sengupta endowment lecture. So I welcome you. Thank you, Paramjit. Please start. Do you want to say something?
Secretary. Madam, can you hear me? Yes, I can. So, uh, on my personal behalf, it is very important for me to welcome her. She, apart from being an eminent scientist, has been a very good friend of mine for the last 10 years. For every year, at least twice to thrice we meet. Not only for a meeting, we work very hard for 10 years. But what I want to convey you is apart from doing that, those hard work, every evening we are on all the members of those meetings are witness to, his, to her infectious energy, contagious energy level by which we used to go out. We sat in the seaside, we walked in the forest, we had fast food together. So to make a meeting really something to look forward is all because of her. Thank you, Param. I think this part of your character nobody knows and we are all witness to this for last one decade thank you very much thank you, thank you so much um, thank you everyone for those very kind words in fact i am uh, overwhelmed by this honor which has been bestowed upon me uh, not that i'm new to um, calcutta university or presidency college i've been to both the places but i was actually looking forward to coming and visiting again the it's been a while now since i've been here but it's it's very nostalgic for me to see such old faces, such respected people. Just, just a moment, Paragi. Yeah. I don't know whether anybody can remember that in 2014, yeah. uh, Jesse Sengupta Memorial Award uh, lecture has been given by whom? Can you remember? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. He was Professor J.P. Khurana. Yeah. In 2014, uh, he has been given this lecture, an okay. endowment lecture. So it is very matter of proud that uh, matter of pride that uh, in a, in same family, yeah. both you and Professor Kurana, both you have you are giving the you have you already given and you are giving the endowment lecture here. So Thank you. in the same family. Yeah. Two persons are and speaker of this endowment. This is really a rare occasion and rare phenomenon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sampadi. Uh, I'm sorry, Professor Sampadas. I am used to calling her Sampadi, so uh, for reminding me. But I think that's a universal fact. And thank you very much, uh, Maitri, also for such a uh, personal touch here. I must thank the members of the committee for choosing me also for this honor. Uh, the second one in our family, I would say. But yes, um, it's a pleasure always. I've been um, inspired by Professor Ahmed Ghosh and <laughs> various capacities, various meetings since a long time. So I was actually, and Dr. Arun Lehri Majumdar, I mean, he's been a teacher for us, I would say, in one way or the other, not directly, indirectly too a great mentor also. So I think it, it's a really honor for me to be present here and to be chosen, selected for this particular award. I would like to thank the botany department also, uh, looking at the climate also, and the students also are there and the faculty members are also there. Some I've met at some occasions and others uh, I was looking forward to interacting, but uh, sometimes it is better to be online because then you are spared with the travel and other details, but you miss on the networking thing as well a little bit. So maybe some other time we'll be there. So thank you very much. And with this, I would like to start sharing my presentation. Uh, OK, is my slides uh, visible? Yes. OK, so wonderful. Uh, this, um, as was mentioned by both uh, the introducers here, that I work on um, plant biotechnology, plant genomics, and the goal is to create climate tolerant crop plants because of the changing climatic conditions. And for that reason, I thought I should uh, caption my title, my presentation as creating climate resilient crops, crops which can withstand the climatic variation uh, with the aid of the information we get in the plant genomics era. 
But before I start, I must thank uh, the person in whose honor I'm giving this lecture. And like was mentioned by Professor Ghosh, uh, Professor mm -hmm. J.C. Sengupta obtained his DPhil from the Heidelberg University. And then he came back to join the Presidency College and served there in various capacities. Uh, subsequently, he became the chief botanist also of the Botanical Survey of India, and also a very major. He played a major role in the administ in the academics yes, of, of West Bengal secondary education as an administrator and then as a president also. Uh, he did work on water absorption of lots of important plants, including including mangroves, jute, mustard, soybean, sesame. Uh, he demonstrated that light affects plants in various ways, you know, day length, photo period or temperature will influence not only the shape of the leaf but also flowering in many plants. He went on to study the hormonal control of fruit set and artificial induction of fruiting. You know, this has been in an era when plant physiology was just taking root and that is why this work is credible. And um, on a very tough plant also like jute, he worked on it and he showed that how nutrient deficiency can affect the growth and the fiber content of jute, which is very important, economically important too. Uh, I think he was an institutional builder also and that is why he set up the Birla Institute of Industrial and Technological Museum and four regional centers of Botanical Survey of India to show the geographical distribution of the BSI in the country. So, uh, in a sense, I would say he was a great scientist, a botanist, an educationist, and a teacher par excellence. And that is why it's an honor to be delivering this talk in, this, in his memory. So, as, I, as my title mentioned that we are in the era of omics, uh, we have uh, genomics, we have transcriptomics, we have proteomics, and we have metabolomics also. That means we are we can study the DNA profile, the RNA profile, the protein, and the metabolites here. And all of them will give you information on different aspects of it. This is a very preliminary, a very basic slide for the students to tell you that genomics would mean will has the potential to tell you as to what all can happen. While transcriptomics transcriptomics tells you what is happening, what appears to be happening. In, at that time point. And proteomics tells you what has happened and what makes it happen. Metabolomics tells you what has happened and what is happening as well. So laden with this information, uh, India was fortunate to have stepped into the, the plant genomics at the international level and we participated. When I say we, I mean India participated in the rice genome sequencing effort. Our labs at Delhi University were part of it. And with this experience, we were invited to participate in the tomato genome program, which was also an international program. And subsequently, we've been also participating in the wheat physical mapping and the wheat genome sequencing program. So these were the three major international programs in which our labs participated. And at home, I mean, in India alone, we've been working extensively on the chlor on mulberry the plant uh, which is of importance to the silk industry. We with our labs part of the sequence the complete chloroplast genome, which happened to be the first genome to be completely sequenced from our country. And recently, that is 2022, we have finished the mulberry genome as well. Uh, we meanwhile, parallelly, we've been working on wheat and mulberry transcriptomics also for various reasons. Uh, abiotic stress tolerance in wheat and uh, both for wheat and mulberry and for other traits as well. So this is a bird's view point of the map-based sequence of the rice genome. And as the name tells you, that the rice has 12 chromosomes and India participated in sequencing, in partial sequencing of the chromosome 11 here. But what is important is that this work was done for the first time with international collaboration, yet all the information of the 12 uh, chromosomes. Uh, there is an issue with the slide. Can you please uh, just go on? Slides are, Slides are not moving. No. Mm -hmm. uh, which slide can you see? It's Omix. The first one. Omics. Pardon? Omics. Omics. This is the first one, Omics. Uh -huh. Omics. <laughs> <laughs> Omix. I don't know. It's just in the normal board. Can you see the next slide now? 
no. That may be. Yeah, it's okay. No, this was the second slide. Now you can see it. Yes, 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 yes. But when I make it full screen, you can't see it. Uh, no. so let it be it's big enough. You can see it. Yeah. You can see this. We... This will not give you the animation. <laughs> okay, we can continue like this. Let me try once. If I can come to the complete or full screen. If that doesn't move, then I'll come back to this. Okay. Screen. Yeah, this is visible now. Yeah. Yes. The rice genome, the tomato genome, the wheat genomes, international programs, and the mulberry genome, which was India alone. And wheat and mulberry transcriptomics, as I mentioned earlier. Okay. Uh, is the next slide visible now? Yes. yes. Okay. So this is the snapshot of the map-based sequence of the rice genome. And I was mentioning that the 12 pseudomolecules of rice, because every chromosome has one molecule of DNA there here, and we call them as pseudomolecules. So what I was saying is, although India participated in sequencing partially the chromosome 11, we obtained the information from all the participating member countries, Korea, Japan, US, China, Taiwan, Brazil, Thailand, and others. And we assembled all the 12 rice chromosomes in-house in Delhi University in a small lab. And this was, we were working and we learned the things on hand. Bioinformatics, we had never done. No one in the country had assembled this amount of DNA. And we were first to do that in-house. And that is why I find it very satisfying experience. Not only that, the RISE genome till today is known as the golden standard for any genome. The reason being that here you have less than one, one base pair mismatch in 10,000 base pair sequence or so. All other sequences which have come after that are draft sequences and the error rate is little more. Here the standard of sequencing is such high that it is known as the gold standard. Only Arabidopsis is of the gold standard type after rice genome. Yeah. Okay, and this is a snapshot. Usually this work was reported in 2005 in Nature. Nature and science, they never cover the same same progress. But in case of rice genome, when that was announced in August, we were supposed to finish the program in December 2005, but the paper appeared in August 2005. That we were ahead of our time and we finished that program. And on the annual meetings, and so this happens to be one of the, the prime pictures here because you have all the participating member leaders from every country. But what is important is I want to mention this person on the extreme left in the maroon color sweater. Yeah, this person, Sasaki, because he for the first time said that we must have all the information in the public database. Subsequently, the Chinese sequenced the rice genome, but that database was data was available in the private database. And this was a public funded effort and the information is also available and freely available across countries to any individual who wants to do it. So, um, after the rise, you know, we the next year itself, we finished the... No, the slides, slides are pro, not moving. Okay. So, I will do one thing. I will... Okay. So, let me be here only then. You can maybe increase the size on the screen. Okay. <laughs> is this is this visible now, the chloroplast genome? Yes. 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 Okay. So the chloroplast genome happened to be the first complete genome to be sequenced from a country. Although it was a small one and it was only our lab which worked on this particular thing. So it was a matter of national satisfaction for us as well, I would say. Subsequently, uh, we have now completed in 2022, we have done the de novo assembly and the, we have shown the functional uh, annotation of mulberry, the Indian mulberry. We have also done a comparative analysis to identify species and tissue specific genes. And we have resequenced about 21 Indian accessions. And we have, uh, we have lots of data which will be of use to the plant breeders. We have about 2.5 million SNPs here and for others, which will eventually be used for translational genomics work here. So like I mentioned earlier, after the rice genome, India was invited to participate in the tomato genome sequencing program. And the tomato genome was 
completed in 2012. We've published that in 2012. But then slowly, the tomato genome sequence uh, was considered to be different from rice genome because it was supposed to provide a insight into the fleshy fruit evolution as to how fleshy fruits have evolved in the countries. Now, interestingly, at this time, um, this picture shows that there is a huge amount of diversity available in the different types of tomatoes which are cultivated, yet the genetic variation between them is very less. So at the genic level, there is less variation. The variation comes subsequent, that is post-genomic uh, regions and so forth. I leave it at that. From the tomato genome, the project soon turned into the Solanaceae genome project. Now, this is important for the students to understand and appreciate that if you sequence one plant from a family, you can extrapolate that information to the other members via comparative genomics. In case of Solanaceae, the tomato genome became the central nodal point here because and this information was then extended to capsicum, to brinjols, to um, this medicinal plant Vidania, to flowering plant, horticulturally important plant like petunia, and to major tuber crops like potato and sweet potato, chilies also. Besides the economically important plants, the members of the Solanaceae have adaptive value in the dry desert and the cold deserts of the country. So it was thought that the Solanaceae genome project of the population would provide insight and diversity into various aspects of plant adaptation and evolution as well. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, initially, when the rice genome program was submitted, it was written for wheat. But at that time of point, the technological advances, the sequencing technologies were not up to the mark and wheat genome was thought never to be ever sequenced. Why? Because the wheat genome is a huge genome. It is about 16,000 megabases, while the rice genome is only 4, 430 megabases and so forth, 400 or so, I would say. And subsequently, uh, in the last decade or so, I think the sequencing technologies advanced so much to the time that now we've been able to sequence the wheat genome also completely. And this was also published in 2018. So uh, wheat is close to my heart and it is close, is very important crop for the country for providing food security. And thanks to the breeders, we've had a green revolution in our country, which has been possible to, which has made it possible to sustain the ever-growing population of a country. But slowly we saw that this green revolution got transformed into the gene revolution and we are heading towards a evergreen revolution by integrating this information which is available to us. However, in the food security uh, in the coming years, uh, at the rate in which our population is growing, we need amounts of food which may be very difficult to obtain. Uh, and not only the quantity, it is the availability to the common man, its accessibility and its affordability also, which is important. <laughs> that means food should be sustainably available to everyone in an affordable fashion. And that is what we are heading to. Now, there is another aspect of it that is agriculture and biodiversity generally do not go hand in hand because you need land uh, for monoculture and like agriculture, but for biodiversity, you need to preserve everything here. And many times the agri different agricultural practices, they have a um, adverse impact on the environment as such also. That is why people have started talking of climate smart agriculture, wherein you are able to efficiently manage the land, the water, and the bio, bio reserves which are available to here so that you can manage your ecosystems for a livelihood in a sustainable fashion. So what are the major challenges which face us when we started out this particular work and when you talk of wheat and other crop other plants? Uh, we came across this particular book, I came across this book, which said that, and I, the title made an impact on me, and it said, we are outgrowing the earth. That means we are outgrowing our natural resources. And what is happening is, the major challenges which we, fee, which we will be facing is of falling water tables and rising temperatures. Two environmental factors which are adversely affecting agriculture. The water tables are going down and the temperatures are rising. However, there is another aspect also. Some people believe that there is enough food for everyone on this planet. 
yet the plates are empty in certain regions of the country. Of the world. Uh, that's about geopolitics of food security, on which I will not dwell into. But I, I thought I will bring that aspect also, highlight just a little bit that uh, not everything which meets the eye is a reality. Economics uh, works in a different way altogether. So let's focus on the first aspect, that is water. Water, I believe, is a lifeblood. And water has no substitute. I don't know how many of you have ever thought you cannot substitute fresh water with anything. While we say that a planet has about 97 water, but 97% of it is saline water and only 3% is fresh water. And it is this 3% also, out of this also, only 1% is fresh surface water because 60 to 70% is blocked in ice caps and glaciers. But it is important. It is important because eventually it will turn into the fresh water. So all life on this planet survives on this 1% fresh water which is available for agriculture or for human use, okay? And what is happening is, if you look at this, is a, this was an animation here, if I can show you just a minute. Yeah. This is a satellite image of different regions where the high plain aquifers which are present here. And if you look at the red color, where water is receding, the groundwater table is receding at more than a meter per year. And it is concentrated in this region, which is known as the Indus River Plain Aquifer. Can you see the Indian map now? Yes. Okay. And you can see the concentric rings here. And the red region comes up here, which is known as the breadbasket of our country, Haryana, Punjab, where wheat is grown and the water was receding at more than a meter per year. And this was good 10 years back. And the situation has not improved. It has gone from bad to worse. Is the water footprint available? No. Oh, okay. No, I'll come back. This is okay now. So there is a terminology known as like the carbon footprint, which is very prevalent. There is a terminology in plant sciences, which is known as the water footprint of different crop plants. What does this mean? This means that different plants need different amounts of water for the productivity, the end product that is seed production. If you look at corn, it need, needs about 450 liters to produce a kilogram of corn. Wheat needs 500 liters of water to produce a kilogram of wheat. Look at rice. It needs 700 liters of water to produce a kg of rice. And soya beans, 900, somewhere in between, which is fine because different crops have different requirements. And that was the reason why rice was cultivated in the water enriched areas, in the coastal regions and regions which had more water. But with shifting agriculture, when rice started growing in the Haryana and Punjab, where water was not this available high, and Basmati variety takes more water as well, the water table started going down drastically, which was we are going against the ecosystems which are available here. Okay, So water, I believe, is going to be the commodity of the future. It's a very simple molecule, you know, H2O. Okay, Yet it is so important that the plant regulates it beautifully. You can have no life without water. Okay, and the plant regulates it depending upon the atmospheric demands. What is the air temperature? What is the wind speed? How much sunlight? How much humidity? And the soil supply. How deep are the roots? How much is the moisture level? What is the soil texture? What is the soil temperature also? We've never thought of these things. And it the plant regulates it beautifully. You know why? Because many plants have certain compounds in them, like the Lea proteins and others, which even the plant has about is about 90 percent is h2o water soft uh, fresh weight but and the desiccated conditions in the seed where it is about 20 percent water and maybe less than that the plant retains its integrity it doesn't die off the cells will rejuvenate when it get they get more water this is because they have these special proteins known as the lia proteins which bind to the membranes and maintain the integrity of the membranous system in the cells and maintain cell viability. So we looked at these proteins here and we engineered that into another plant in wheat also. Uh, uh, in wheat, we engineered them for drought and salinity tolerance and we have shown that, that yes, it confers drought and salinity tolerance. I'm not showing the raw data. You can take my word for that. But more importantly, we were approached by the sericulture people in down south 
because uh, they they plant mulberry as a plantation crop now a plantation crop once you once you cultivate in the field it will stay in the field for 5 to 10 years or so it's not a annual that you harvest after 3 months or 6 months and so forth and it is usually planted in areas which receive high rainfall and because the growth rate of mulberry is only second to bamboo it can grow tremendously it can grow to about a feet also in one day and the shoots are trimmed and fed to the silk worm who will then eventually give you the silk for the silk and the entire sericulture industry depends on it so we were approached by the sericulture people institute uh, because we had the wheat uh, transgenics with us which would give resistance to nematode and others also and they have a nematode problem in sericulture also so they wanted us to get involved and we did get involved but not for the insect first because we didn't have a gene right for them but we had for the apatic stress tolerance so we introduced in this lia protein in the mulberry transgenics also and you can see this is a non transgenic while these three are the transgenics and when you give them when you stop watering the plants for two weeks or so these are still growing well while this is dying now in case of mulberry the leaf are trimmed and fed to the silkworm and the silkworm will eat it for 3 to 4 days so it is and you ask the sericulturists as to what is important they say the leaf should be nice and succulent and juicy and so forth so we could not translate that into analytical terms what we understood was that it should have a nice fresh it should be palatable to the silkworm so what is important is uh, after decapitation from the plant after 3 to 4 days what would be the water level so this lower graph if you concentrate on the blue bars that will indicate after decapitation from the plant the water content in the leaves these are the non transgenics where the water reduces to about 40% relative water content but in the transgenics you can see it is about 70 to 80% or so and we were very happy this was only not giving the plants water for 20 days we then did an experiment no watering for 2 months and the plants still survived while the non transgenics did not survive at all these transgenics were characterized everything all detailed analysis was done and we characterized them for drought and salinity tolerance we did all the experimentation at delhi university and the plants were transferred to the central sericulture research institute at mysore mm -hmm. and later to university of agricultural sciences in bangalore gkvk campus in 2013 and 2009 itself they have been growing they have been maintaining these trans these mulberry transgenics and they are flourishing even till then now we thought they would be ready available after bt cotton that they would also be released but our biotech uh, policies did not permit for that as of now they are just lying there here okay so i'll shift gears and come back to wheat the important crop plant and i thought i'll introduce in this basic slide for the students uh, just to indicate that wheat is a hexaploid most of the plants which you see are diploid he, they have two parents wheat has is hexaploid and it has three parental genomes they are the a genome b genome and the d genome plus nearly 80% of the wheat dna is repetitive dna so it is it made life hell for us to do any functional genomics work in wheat in the pre uh, era and when we started this work um, very little transcriptomics work was done in wheat we had less than 100 asts per megabases of the genome in comparison to rice which had 3000 and maize had 500 asts per mb because at that time it was only functional genomics which was thought to be the deliverable possibility in wheat and others plus it is sensitive to most of the abiotic stresses also uh, susceptible and of course it's important we had the wheat transgenics we had the transgenics in emmer wheat which is a diploid wheat durum wheat the pasta wheat which is a tetraploid and the bread wheat which is a hexaploid we had transgenics in all three of them but we could never take them to the field conditions because we could not do the segregation analysis now mind it in case of bread wheat which you have a hexaploid the amount of segregation is so complex that if you have a transgene here to to do that kind of analysis number one we did not have so many plants transgenic plants which are available wherever we had the population the population size was very less so we were stuck so what we did is we did the next best thing which is double difficult but we raised haploids in wheat introduced the gene of interest in the hep in the haploids diploidized them 
created double diploid so that the genotype now would be fixed. We would have no problem of segregation at all. So we thought this was a good way to get across it and we were able to do that. And these double haploids, we then uh, screened them for salinity and drought tolerance. This shows you that the non-transgenic will not germinate under 400 millimolar of salinity stress while the transgenics germinate. Not only in the vegetative trait, but even in the single seed weight and seed spike and test weight uh, of the transgenics, when you think of the maturity link traits here, what is the percentage reduction with any stress? In case of the non-transgenics, it's about 50% yield is lost. But in case of all the transgenics, which we screened seven to eight double diploid ones, it was about 20 to 25% or so average where the yield reduction was there. It was very good, but still because of uh, we thought we would now be able to give this wheat transgenics to the field to, to the farmers and to others to do the field trials but yet even then that was also not possible although we had um, uh, wheat which was screened and shown to be drought and salinity tolerant uh, way back um, also subsequently what we have done is only from the academic point of view because very rarely you have a double diploid which is in the t8 generation t9 generation the T7 generation and others, we screened that because they are exactly the same except one gene which is there. So we've done a comparison with that and we've shown these transgenics. Besides drought and salinity, they are also tolerant to heat stress. Okay, but they are there in the desiccators. The seeds are there. We have few seeds. We cannot multiply them because we cannot grow the transgenics in the field conditions and the biotech policies are such that we transgenics, we don't favor them very much. So we shifted our attention to the second problem of wheat. Uh, we thought we've done it and uh, now it is up to the breeders to take this material. The second problem which we took up in wheat was of global warming. And here, this is a normal satellite image predictions showing that average temperatures will rise about five to six degrees centigrade. Uh, going in the immediate past, I mean in 2005 and six, when we had just published our rice genome, India witnessed a very severe heat wave. And this heat wave, the temperatures were about 7 degrees above normal in the month of February to March. Okay. In case of um, crop plants, it is said that every degree which increases brings down productivity by 4%. In case of wheat, because it's a temperate plant, the productivity goes down by 6% or so. So you calculate when 7 degrees temperature was arisen in this stage. This is a stage which is critical because at this stage, the spike emerges from the vegetative state. So if the spike gets hit by heat stress, the productivity goes down drastically and we lost about more than 40% of our crop only because of heat wave. And I think this was a wake-up call that we need to do something about wheat, study that. And it is the heading stage, everyone said, which was most critical. But we see that wheat, which is grown in the central region, faces heat stress during the tillering stage, not the heading stage. So we realize that whatever is going to be the mechanism of tolerance or protection at the heading stage will not work at the in the southern states because their heat stress is is um, witnessed, is uh, tolerated at the tillering stage. So you need to have a different mechanism. That is when we started. Uh, and we also realized that besides these two stages, the fertility is severely compromised. So we needed to target the reproductive organs also. And we did exactly all that. Uh, remember a while ago, I said that the world never thought, scientists never thought internationally the wheat would be sequenced. And what was the international mandate? The international objective number one and two were for EST production. So you make the cDNA libraries, do the screening, do the sequencing, analyze, and then use this information for functional genomics analysis as well. Use this for the mapping populations to do comparative deletion mapping or comparative mapping. Do lots of functional genomics with different things which were available or do genome structure and evolution. So we did exactly that, but I'm not giving you the details. And
work. Mm -hmm. We have one or two publications too in it. We have worked on different types of transcription factors, the zinc finger, the maths box, the BZIP, and the HSF, which are the master regulators of heat stress. We've done worked on lots of signal transducers, BR protein, a vacuole protein, a lipid transfer protein, and so forth. Worked on many osmolites and many other miscellaneous ones also. But at the end of it, despite all these publications, all this work, when I go and interact with the farmers in the wheat, they asked me just one thing, ma'am, ye bataye, which wheat will be able to tolerate my heat stress? So I realized they did not need molecular biology. They needed something basic to distinguish which varieties are tolerable and which are not tolerable. And once the standing crop in the field faces heat stress, can we suggest something for them to overcome the stress-induced damage? That is when we... we took more than a dozen ruling varieties of wheat. We devised a heat susceptibility index based on the photosynthetic potential in the vegetative stages and others. We also did carbon uh, assimilation that uh, response also in others. And we established a heat susceptibility index according to which we categorized the wheat varieties that these are the relatively should be heat tolerant, while these would be more heat sensitive. And we validated this information and it turned out to be true. Now, if you, <coughs> again, there was animation here. Uh, we miss out on that here. But if you look at the top panel, these two varieties are ones which we have predicted will be heat tolerant, while these would be heat sensitive. This is the under normal conditions. This is how the grains look. When you give it the heat stress, when they face heat stress in the field, this is what the grain transforms in. Compare this with this, this with this, this with this. Okay? No one thinks that these are wheat grains and the market value is zero. So, in a parallel experiment, we were working on somatic embryogenesis. We came across the BRI gene, which helped in elevating that. And we started, we thought, after the field, in the field, after the spike has faced heat stress, can we spray something to negate this effect that the seeds are not like this? And when we, after heat stress, when we added the BRI, we sprayed, these grains got transformed into these, okay. which are maybe better than this, much, much better, but nearly equivalent to the original ones also, in the tolerant ones, but in the sensitive ones, it is still a little bit missing in it. But this chemical is very expensive and we cannot give it to the farmer to spray. But in principle, as a proof of concept, if we introduce this gene in wheat, it should give protection against the this also. So we shifted our gears and started looking at other traits. Yes. Any problem? Okay. So we started looking at other heat adaptive traits in wheat and we rounded about with radiation use efficiency, we left the other things there. We have already worked on the others. And we concentrated on carbon fixation, not by rubisco, but by rubisco activities. We explored the possibility of the role of spike photosynthesis and what is the role of membrane thermostability in heat stress tolerance. We also looked into the origins of the bread wheat. We brought in the wild relatives of wheat. Uh, the A genome, we now know the contributor is Triticum monococcum. The D genome is contributed by Triticum toshi. The origin of the B genome is not very clear. It could be Tergidum or Speltoidus, mm -hmm. but B genome is there. So by tools of comparative genomics, we thought we should be able to introgress genes from the wild mm -hmm. mm -hmm. This slide shows you, uh, again, there was animation here. I cannot show you the plants. But Agilot Proshai and Agilot Spelkoid, these are two wild relatives of each. And the normal conditions, this is the photosynthate partitioning. How energy, how the photochemistry works under conditions. And if you concentrate only on PS2, in case of Proshai, five days of continuous heat stress, the photosynthetic activity is not compromised too much. It is still at 73%. While in Speltoidus, which is the sensitive one, the PS2 activity reduces from 76 to 26% or so. So we started looking at these factors here. Even we found the role of spike photosynthesis as to what is its role. We did a differential expression of the genes of the spike on tissue. And interestingly, we found two isoforms of uh, 
Rubisco activates, not Rubisco activates, uh, uh, yeah, rib uh, ribulose uh, carboxylase activates. The B1, which is upregulated by heat stress, and the A uh, homologue, which is downregulated by heat stress. We validated uh, many of the other genes in the relatively sensitive variety and the tolerant variety of wheat. And you can see here the A isoform is low in both the cases. It is high in expression in the tolerant variety. So we took this particular homologue, transformed and uh, studied its expression in the leaf tissue, in the spike and the grain tissue. Now since wheat is a hexaploid, for every gene you have six, six at least homologues which are present here, homologues rather I should say. And uh, this particular homologue was the one which was expressive both in the leaf tissue as well as the spike and the grain. We introduced that into rice, made the rice transgenics, understood the vegetative as well as the reproductive behavior. Here you can see under heat stress what is a relative expression. This is under control conditions in transgenics, all are high. And if you look at the photosynthetic efficiency, which we measure by FE by FN, it is after heat stress in the transgenics as compared to the non uh, we also check for the reproductive status in the transgenics with the RCA B isoform rice transgenic. It was much higher the seed set, and more importantly, the rate of the sterility which is induced in the florets upon heat stress that goes down, and the fertility rate increases in the transgenics upon integration of this gene. So we have a candidate. We had lots of these such candidate genes which we analyzed here. Besides that, we've also uh, subsequent to that worked on other uh, genes in wheat. One such one is uh, OBF, which is a heat responsive. Uh, it interacts with many of the HSPs and it translocates them from the nucleus to the ER, uh, indicating that they are important in the protein unfolding response. Of late, we have realized that it is the protein unfolding response which plays a major detoxification role of the heat stress and plants which are higher in it, they can withstand heat much. We have also ventured a little bit into the epigenetic regulation of heat stress. Um, now we have looked at the methylases, the DNA methylases and the histone methylases also. We have a couple of publications, but I'm not going to go into the details here. So what we have done so far is we have looked at the genes which are important for acquisition of thermotolerance, be it transcription factors, modulators, uh, enzymes and so forth. We have started venturing into the heat stress memory, mm -hmm. which is because of protein modeling mm -hmm. or because of methylation modifications as well. So this will give us long-term adaptation to heat stress and we need to work on so what we have been able to do is we've been able to see the parameters which affect photosynthesis under heat stress, which affect seed germination under heat stress, which have a negative impact on various reproductive developments during heat stress and which uh, seed yield also in the heat stress and so on. Last two slides I would like to introduce in another topic, a non-transgenic approach which we are trying. Um, this is uh, focusing more not on above ground but on the below ground, that is the soil, because um, everyone knows that without soil you can have nothing. And soil is the source of 90% of the world's agricultural water. Which is and Indian soils and the soils world over are highly degraded and no one cares for them much. Uh, fortunately for us, we live in a microbial world and we can talk of, uh, think of, we've collaborated on metagenomics for various things here and I thought maybe that approach could be uh, tried for each test already working because the microbes will also help you um, support and protect the crop plants under adverse environmental conditions. Uh, we know of PGPRs which uh, are specific to different flows, to different environments, to different stresses also. And various microbial consortia can be tailored to specific environmental conditions. So we looked at that aspect also. We wanted to see what is the impact, what would be the different consortia, which if it is possible to engineer for uh, host stress tolerance, why are the microbes? Uh, that work is still preliminary, but it is very 
uh, promising because many of these plant growth regulating rhizobia, they not only provide nutrition and aid growth to the crop plant, but they also provide uh, resistance and tolerance against pests and pathogens also by different mechanisms above ground and below ground, both of them. We have some data which I'm not sure, but um, we are, um, I am very optimistic about risers we are engineering now, that that may be the way forward in a, in a transgenic hostile environment as I call it, because uh, what we have been doing so far was transgenic, but now we are focusing on non-transgenic approaches. While people have engineered the rhizosphere for salinity, drought, and many other stresses, we are focusing more on heat stress and see how it can aid, uh, whether it is by nutrient uptake or phytohormone production or whatever be the mechanism of action, if it can provide some. So, basically, I think uh, what is possible is, uh, this is an era where the genomics information is getting translated to better effective gains. Whether it is for the of genetic resources or genomic resources, basic challenges, genotype to the genotype gap. Available high end technologies with which are good for. So I personally would on the straightforward career. You bend left, you bend right, you go in circles. So what is important is it's a it's a meandering career. You it is not a straight path. And uh, we think that we will be able to make a map forward as everything is still here, but that is not the case. I think what is important is to just have a build a compass to show the direction and leave the beginning. Thank you very much for your attention. I would be, I don't know, uh, would be happy to take any questions or clarifications if there are any. I hope uh, the gist was visible because the slides, uh, I missed out on much of the animation part of it, but it uh, doesn't matter. I think the online has its advantages and little bit of glitches many a times. But I would be happy to clarify if anyone has any uh, cobwebs to be cleared, I would say. Thank you very much. Hello, about, uh, can, I, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Sis, this is my tree. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can. Okay. This is about your rice cultivation slide. About 1700 tons water. Water fruit. Water per, footprint. Uh, yeah. Yes. Water yes. footprint. Yeah. This is about yeah. that slide. Yeah. I am just hearing, it's, um, mm. I'm just hearing from people that the rice cultivation in India is slowly going to be moving to upland rice cultivation to avoid water. Is that right? Yeah, they, they are aiming for that. They are not getting a lot of success there, but they want to do so because of this problem only. You know, all right. the stubble burning and everything which is occurring in the northern region is because of this. To save water, they have varieties mm -hmm. developed, the breeders, which will yeah. which are delayed sowing. So they get into the wheat sowing period. So uh, the field is not empty in between and wheat has to be planted by Diwali time or so before the winter sets in. And when wheat is pushed, it flowers late and then the heat stress comes. So it is a management problem also, which was not there earlier. Exactly. But, but with so economic has to be solved. Yeah. yeah. So they want to get two, two crops of rice and rice cultivation to save water. They're pushing it at the later end of it, which is getting into the wheat cultivation period. That is the primary cause. Yes, I know of people who are trying to now create the upland varieties also, but it has not been very yeah. successful. No, that's just an idea. But from yeah. you, no, I know no, that it is. it is possible. Yeah. 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 People are working on that. The Erie Institute, the Indian Rice Research at Katak and Hyderabad, they're all trying for the upland rice well. And also for the direct sowing also. 
because it is during the sowing time that it needs more water. Direct seeded variety is also being tried. That is <coughs> another approach which they are trying. The other question is about monoculturing. Like in the beginning, you said that agriculture itself is detrimental yes, because it's a monoculture. Right? Yes, so yes. even there, the problem is with management, right? If yes, that can be done, it should be done, right? What yeah. prevents us from doing, you know, alternate culture or you know, culturing together and everything? So these, I mean, these for us, it is very easy to sit and say that do the maintain the yeah. ecosystem. The farmer does not think of it like that. He wants to sell his land for highways, for urbanization, he gets more money. For him, it is the economics which matters. He will grow basmati because he can export that. He will not grow the other local varieties because they don't have high returns. For the farmer, it is, it's, a, it's a different perspective altogether, different motive, objective, you know. That is the case. Yes. We say that this is, but in a democratic country, you can't say that. In other countries, you can say that, yes, use only this much land for rice cultivation. How do you stop the farmers from cultivating more? Tell me. You cannot. Yeah, you in, the in, in the beginning, you said that I'm not going to dig on that. The, yeah. the other problem. So yeah. that's where the problem is, actually. Yes, it is. It scientists is. really cannot do anything. No. But scientists can only give them better varieties because what is happening is land... Agriculture is shrinking. So you need to improve your productivity. China, we are second in productivity as compared to China in rice production. Or it is we are second because we we sow more land under rice. China has less. They get a higher yield per hectare land as compared to India. So we need to aim to bridge that in our product. And that and for that. For that, if you take a satellite picture of the greenhouse emission, you see yeah. what, hap what is happening with China and India, with the rest yeah. of the world. So Very we are true. paying for that also. Yes. But uh, we somehow think that we have the burden of feeding the whole world. That is yeah. also there. Okay. Is it? okay, thank you, Param, for the talk. Yeah. Param, can I ask you another question? Yes, yes Sampadi. Sorry. Yes, please. <laughs> You did not mention about the your relating work in Malbe. Yes. So you, I, I can't uh, hear you properly. <laughs> that you didn't mention properly, but you studied more than hundred million is based on the. Uh, structure of the protein or uh, the su sugar affinity or what else? We've done uh, not sugar affinity, we did the, you know, I would tell you the lectin which we use first for salinity and drought tolerance, that is for salinity and droughts. We had another weak transgenics for a nematode resistance. So the mulberry people wanted it for the nematode resistance. But that nematode resistance is uh, the protein which we had was a um, trypsin inhibitor, which would affect the silkworm also. So we, we told them not to use this because we don't want the end, uh, the host to stop eating the silkworm. That would defeat the whole purpose, right? That is why we never could develop the uh, nematode resistance in mulberry. But with respect to the other lectins, we have done that because the lectins will help provide drought and salinity tolerance. We have introduced those genes in, in mulberry the same one. And we've done a genome-wide analysis of the entire family in mulberry. You know, in mulberry, we were very much interested in the lectins because it's a very strict, it's not a symbiotic association. You see, mulberry, mm -hmm. the silk of the leaf will be the mulberry leaf and not any other leaf. It, even in mulberry, it will not, it will eat morus indica, it will not eat morus lavigata or morus uh, syrup. That's the cold one. Okay. So it is highly specific. So we were more interested is what would be the affinity between the silkworm and the plant. We were more interested in that kind of an interaction to study that interaction. But uh, so this is a of different lectins, but uh, we couldn't do much in that. That was the motive of starting with the lectins. May I? Yes, please. Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Can you see me next to Amitra? 
modification type probably that we go through i don't know have we thought about it mm. one of the policy makers i don't have that confidence now that i should do that <laughs> to be honest it's uh, i'm little prejudiced now against uh, these technologies and i'm sort of losing faith in the indian policy makers i would say that okay. is and see i i have i have here yeah. I thought the brain gel has been uh, approved by Gender Engineering Approval Committee. Is that correct? Yes, it not brain gel, mustard, mustard has. Mustard, yeah. but but that's not approved by Gender. Yeah, mulberry, not no, mulberry. Uh, okay. Mustard transits have been approved, but uh, they still have lots to do till it goes to the field. Um, yeah. people are not very optimistic even then now for mustard also, and I tell you why I was very optimistic when I started the mulberry work. because mulberry is something which is vegetatively propagated we don't consume that it was meant for the insect to eat like your bt cotton so i thought there would be wider acceptability in bt in cotton it is the cotton seed oil which is still consumed by humans in mulberry it is not that it's the fruit which is consumed so we we had specific promoters also put up so that it is expressed only in the leaf but and it is vegetatively propagated so gosh just imagine how easy it would have been to pass it on to the farmers you know cut a twig give them a cutting and that's it and they would propagate it on their own we don't even have to do the progeny analysis you just do it vegetatively propagate it and maintain it mm. but um, it's very difficult you know you you are against a wall you cannot yeah, logic but, does not work there yeah but in the in an advanced countries european countries also not allowing this uh mulberry is not grown in the european countries no no i'm not i'm not talking about mulberry i'm talking about genetically engineering yes. so it's not, not allowed in european countries and they are advanced in courts so they don't allow it so in fact a, in fact there's a question of human perception also that right? yes. yes yes it does it yes, is it there does. and we are essentially guard, guided by them the us and the african countries and others they are freely growing even the genome edited crops everything yes. they have the transgenics also we eat everything coming from there indirectly but directly we don't but it's a it's a very sad situation there i would say so genetically modified mustard we cannot eat but when canada sends us genetically oil yeah. extracted from genetically modified mustard we accept that that's right it happens for many other plants like that so in those countries they produce and they send it we import it because our oil crisis is really very strong we need it's, not, it's not only science the policy of science yes <laughs> yes i agree i agree totally and who 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 does it the academic people all of us are responsible for it i think sometimes we are not those, very vocal those who are in the different academies and different positions who take the policy papers who are yeah who are involved in the uh, policy making uh, you and professor gosh are also in those committees uh, not in the jm ones they will never put me because they know my view point i am never invited to any discussion anywhere because they know the policy since you mentioned i was a part of both gsc and genetic engineering approval committee the problem is you know no 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 the problem is not what you are saying you see these are huge 
political connotations. Yeah. Even if you get it approved, it has to go through several. It's a government of India policy. Let me just, you know, come out a little. You know, there was a big strike about the pharma strike and all that. But if yeah. you gone through it, there's some aspects were really good. Yeah. But nobody talked about them. Justice was, yes. it was thrown, uh, thrown uh, into the waste basket. But it was not in like that. There's lots of things in it which were really beneficial for the farmers themselves. It didn't go through. So it's not a question, as you are saying, that you are in the policy. It's not like that. I think it's, it's science over, communication which comes in. in it's how you communicate your work. No, no, I think we are getting diverted. The reason, answer is very simple. I mean, look at what is happening in the education system in West Bengal. See, this is Everybody. not cool. It has got a lot to do with the political thing. It's about the power structure, about how do you get votes and all of those things. Yeah. See, you see, <laughs> still farmers do not pay income tax, yes. but many of them uh, ride Rolls Royce. Yeah. But we can't do it because, you know, these are different issues. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. I that. Okay. The anyway, let's come back, to, come back to the main point. The second question that I had in mind, uh, Tharun, is this, yeah. that all genes are uh, really... Uh, <laughs> they need to be like you say, for example, like BT. BT yeah. and food crops would not be taken up, was not accepted very well. But genes which are not really, uh, which are alleles, which are simple alleles with a character in BT, those shouldn't have been uh, rejected. Yeah. We were very conscious of this fact which you have just mentioned and that is the reason I have always worked on the HVA gene. This is from Hordium vulgare, agglutinin. Because Hordium vulgare, we eat Hordium also. You know, it is part of a nutrition too. So from a, from a smaller food crop to a bigger food crop would be, I thought would be better acceptable. We have been very conscious of that. I've Even the trypsin inhibitor which I took for engineering in wheat came from potato, not from any other plant. So I was very careful right from the beginning that we, because I knew the responsibilities and I knew the effects it would have when you, uh, when you manipulate a food crop. So one needs to be very conscious of what you are doing, how you are doing. It's a debate um, which will continue for some time. Uh, sure. I'm sure. Hey, students, do you have any I say that we, based on my own work, Karun, Yes. Uh, it, it was an allelic form of a gene which yeah. gave it a tolerant phenomenon. Yeah. That was also not acceptable to India. Yeah. No. You say it's transgenic. But yeah. how come? So even in yeah. your committee yeah. members, they do not understand many a times. They do not get into yeah. the policy. Yeah. And usually it is the breeders who are there and they have their own... Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Professor Kurana. Uh, yes. Myself, uh, Dr. Finashi Acharya from Horticulture. Okay. And uh, one of my questions is like in Punjab, the farmers were previously cultivating quinoa mm -hmm. oranges. And now they are uprooting the kino plants and they are, uh, they are uh, substituting it with tomatoes. Okay. A lot of area is under tomato cultivation. Uh -huh. so my question is that after the genome project in tomato was completed, yeah. how far has, has been the development of heat tolerant tomato lines in India? Uh, heat tolerance in tomato was never uh, priority number one for tomato breeding because tomato is relatively tolerant to heat okay it, it, the productivity drop is because of other things i think in tomato not because of heat stress is not important in tomato it's but it grows light. yes but there the are light. certain varieties which are sensitive but most of them uh, i've been told by the tomato breeders that they can grow it year round that is not much of a problem yeah, that is being grown year round, but the like. But I don't know the kino problem and the tomato problem in in uh, in Punjab and Haryana. I think it is because of overproduction of something. Maybe. Kino uh, give very good yield. Tomato also gives very good yield, and in the in the times when tomato is harvested, it is dumped also. So we need um, 
अदर में क्या दे 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 डोंट नीड अ साइंटिफिक सॉल्यूशन दे नीड अ मैनेजमेंट सॉल्यूशन इट इज एग्रीकल्चरल मैन प्रोड्यूस मैनेजमेंट व्हिच इज रिक्वायर्ड एंड दैट इज द रीजन व्हाई मेनी ऑफ द फूड फैक्ट्रीज हैव कम अप इन पंजाब हरियाणा आल्सो बट वी आर नॉट एबल टू सस्टेन आई डोंट नो मे बी यू आर इन अ बेटर पोजीशन टू टेल मी ओके माय माय सेकंड क्वेश्चन इज विद मलबेरी या मल मलबेरी दो द सर्कलचर uh industry told you that uh, you know it grows uh, very well under humid conditions yeah. as you told but uh, <laughs> what i saw in bijanir also in rajasthan mm-hmm. uh, there mulberry plants were growing under drip irrigation system not much water was uh, needed and the temperature you know there was 45 okay. to 48 like that during the summer months okay. and those and those were edible types yes okay those varieties are different those must be serrata type the edible ones are the ones in which the silkworm does not feed now this is very different in mulberry the ones which the silkworm eats they has that does not have a good fruit but the fruit varieties are different so there is a big difference in there and the mulberry is a tree species you see so once the root system is established then there isn't a problem for the sericulture they need leaf material more so they grow the other ones and they keep pruning the leaf and they maintain it as a shrub so we can go for grafted plants there you can go for yes and they do grafting also they do grafting also in rajasthan and other areas it is grown for the fruit type yes where you don't need the leaf and their drip irrigation will work because the rooting is very nice rooting is not an issue if it is deep rooted it can grow plus the foliage can be given even to the for as used as fodder also there Okay. even in kashmir there the tree species is a different variety and that is cold tolerant we started working on these for these aspects we thought from the cold tolerant serrata we can get the genes for cold tolerance i didn't tell you i was invited by drdo to give a talk in in ladakh because some of our varieties we had proved that they were cold tolerant also drought salinity heat and cold tolerant we have four traits in malpuri but in ladakh they will not grow uh, silkworm they will not grow mulberry because they don't promote sericulture it is religious thing there because when you when you get silk from the silkworm you need to boil the cocoons and during boiling of the cocoons the worm is still inside the cocoon so they have they have, the silk which is produced there is branded as a different way it is known as ahinsa silk where the worm is let out of the cocoon but it will give you short fibers of silk because the cocoon gets damaged and you know in one cocoon there is only one silk fiber that is why you get a very long fiber in one cocoon but the moment the worm comes out and flies away it has created a hole in the cocoon and that will give you shorter silk threads so it is never uh, wherever there is buddhist community they will never um, get into silk it is from that point of view so that's why many times scientific <laughs> solutions are there but the non scientific uh, sensitivities they take and we face that problem so and soil type is also important yes yes soil type yes. soil yes. is black soil is generally preferred for mulberry for sericulture the tree species you can have the others also <laughs> and the very different serrata is very different from indica and lavigata and lavigata is very different any query from student side no no all is as follow hello sir what is the question what is the question no no what is the question hey hello krishna dia honey i bolichi we announce uh thank you madam uh now special uh, uh, remarks will be given by professor shivaji chakraborty president of uh, west bengal academy of science and technology and also felicitate uh, and also felicitate uh, our respected speaker okay Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kurana. And uh, at the outset, I apologize to you because I could not come earlier because I was in, I, mean, I had to take part in another meeting which was going on. And then I rushed from there and ultimately reached a little bit late. So I apologized for that. And uh, uh, the point is, I am an electrical engineer. So when yes. I come to this sort of forum, yeah. uh, I feel like fit out of water. Uh, but the way you people talk, then I learn a lot. Because these are all so important, uh, not only from the you know social perspective, but for also from the national growth perspective. And yeah. of course, scientific community and the science and technology perspective. So. The last part of your talk and the introductions that I was hearing, it was definitely for me uh, some input which I can probably you know use and uh, tell to the technology students who are you know completely different domains. So thank you very much for accepting our uh, invitation and delivering this uh, very nice talk on a very topical subject. And uh, on the other side, thank you very much, my very senior colleagues from. Uh, West Bengal Academy of Science and Technology, my uh, senior faculties of the Department of Botany, the coordinators of Saracharya, and uh, very importantly, all of you, the students. Uh, I don't know exactly which level you are. I understand that are all bachelor's, master's. Master. You are at Hello. Hello. Can't hear. I'm sorry, I cannot hear. The voice is not audible. Hello. No, no, but I cannot hear. I cannot hear from there. They are muted. Okay, okay, now I got it. I got it. I got it. Yeah. Go on. Only the audio is not audible. Video is fine. Who are yeah. professional yeah. science and technology yeah. in all these respective domains? Okay. So, what are our activities? You can always ask. Yes, that's a very big question always. What are our activities? Uh, primarily, of course, our activity is to provide sort of policy guidelines, the future roadmap in which direction the things are going, for example, you see today the talk. So these are one of our focal areas of work. And then also, as I already said, we recognize outstanding people in their respective domains and anybody who is elected as fellow of West Bengal Academy, they are already identified as you know, somebody who is really, or who has really contributed significantly in their area. That's a, that's a recognition automatic comes with that. And uh, we have three 
endowment lecture today you saw one there are two other endowment lectures uh, we organize uh, every year and in addition to that we also organize programs in memory of very uh, very very respected people for example this year we have organized in memory of professor m s swaminathan and similar you know people so we all do that sort of thing and now West Bengal Academy of Science and Technology is uh, reaching out because we don't think that uh, we should only, you know, stay within a couple of academic institutions or, for example, research institutions. We have to reach out because time has changed. I cannot say that when I graduated in 1983 and today 2024 is the same. The generation is completely different. Uh, you people, I mean, when I was of your age. The way I used to think, I used to act. You are completely different. You have to accept it. So we are trying to reach out. We are trying to organize different types of programs. I request the faculty members also, if you have some idea, which one academy is now open. Uh, we can collaborate with you. And uh, if there is any proposal, please forward it to our, uh, you know, uh, senior uh, fellows. Yes. Then we can really think about it that how to take it forward. So with this few words, and once again, uh, yeah. and uh, it is my pleasure and uh, very honor, my privilege to uh, felicitate our very distinguished speaker, Professor Paranjit Purana, and we have a uh, plaque for this endowment lecture, Professor Purana. We have prepared it. Okay. So, Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Now I think you can have some glimpse yeah. of it. Yeah, I can. I can. Thank and you. And we much. will make sure that it reaches you. Thank you. Uh, and I hope that you have some place on your wall or on your table to keep yes, it. Yes, I do. I do. So I please do. accept it from uh, uh, West Bengal Academy of Science and Technology. Thank you, sir. Thank very you very much. much. Thank you very much. Thank you. So with this, with a lot of uh, appreciation and thanks to all of you for coming together in very large numbers and making this program a successful one. Thank you very much. Professor Chappu, I will request. My name is Omiya Bhakti. Oh, yes. I, uh, I and my late wife, Joshua, the daughter of Dr. Sengupta, is responsible for this endowment. Can you please inform us, me, Joshua is no longer there, when the lecture is 